I'm Alan Hall, host of the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. Our guest today is Rosemary Barnes, founder and CEO of Pardalote Consulting. Pardalote is based in Canberra, Australia, and as we all know, Australia is a leader in renewable energy. Pardalote Consulting provides consulting services to wind developers, asset owners, and inventors. And Pardalote specializes in technical due diligence, technical assessments, and patent evaluation. They have a deep understanding of the clean energy industry and are able to provide clients with accurate and unbiased information. Rosemary is also a creative force and host of the wildly popular YouTube channel, Engineering with Rosie, and she is co-host of the world-famous Uptime Wind Energy podcast. Rosemary, <laughs> welcome to the program. Thank you. What a great intro. Your best, your best ever. Well, Rosemary, we wanted to have you on the podcast because we've never highlighted your consulting business, which is ex extremely popular in Australia and around the world because you are one of the world's blade experts. Uh, you want to describe what Partalo does? I know I gave a little intro there, but you can describe a little bit better than I can. So we work with all kinds of energy transition technologies, not just wind. Um, but I guess today we might as well focus on the, the wind energy part. All of aspects of the technology development life cycle. So that goes right from um, conceptual design all the way through to implementation and um, claims assessments. So Rosemary, your background is in structural engineering, and most particularly composite engineering for blades. I, I did all of my um, degrees in Australia. I did one year of my undergraduate degree in the US at UC Davis. I, at the time, I had this idea I wanted to be an aerospace engineer, and UC Davis was a really good aero school. So I went there and completed all of the core um, aerospace subjects in one year, um, which was just a, a lot to do all at once, but also really fun. And I learned in the process that I didn't really want to be an aerospace engineer, um, mostly because I'm not so driven to work in defense, which is where most of the money is. But I'm lucky enough, uh, coincidentally, all of the same um, science and you know, analysis that you use for aeroplanes and spacecraft is very closely related to wind energy. So I went back to university and did a PhD, a structural design project on yeah composite material structures, specifically related to wind turbines. It was yeah or new new ways to design wind turbine blades and other complex composite structures. Um, and then I handed that thesis in one day and literally the next day I was on a plane to Denmark to go meet the team of a company I had a job offer with. Um, and yeah, I ended up accepting that and, and living in Denmark for five years. And you were working with LM Wind Power, which obviously is a huge uh, company in terms of blade production and has some of the most advanced blades on the planet. So you got to be in the factory for a number of years. And that's I consider that to be a huge advantage if you're an engineer, because you can understand how the blades are made and designed. So when you see problems out in the field, you can get a basic understanding of probably what happened. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, it's incredibly hard work to work in a factory. And I have always massively respected those engineers that work full time in a factory because, you know, I would go for a month, two months, three months, maybe um, when I was taking a new product into prototyping or into serial production. Um, but the schedules are intense because, you know, those factories are like a finely tuned machine to push blades out, uh, you know, usually every 24 hours on the dot, you know, one, one comes, one comes off. And so it's almost like choreographed like a you know, like a group group dance ensemble would be in terms of you know every every part happens just right to make sure that the the flow of blades um, off the line doesn't stop so um it's really good to have that experience to see you know the environment that these are made in it's one thing to design a blade on a computer um and you know it's like a little little stick like this that you can you can move around on your computer screen something nice and small and then you go there and see what a 70, 80 meter blade actually looks like and the reality of, of how they're made. You know, it's mostly, uh, um, it, it's a pretty manual process. There's some automated, you know, assistance, but in general, it's, um, it's very manual. And the kinds of engineering design and the controls that you need to make sure that you get a consistent high quality product out of a manual process, that's really um yeah, you have to kind of experience it to understand it, I think. And so then, yeah, I also um, worked on the other side as well when I was working with um, blade heating systems to keep 
blades ice free in cold climates. So we would, um, you, you know, I would work on the the new product integration in the factory, but then also installing it in the field, um, commissioning, validating, um, climbing towers to make sure that the systems still look the way they were supposed to after the, you know, after a few months after the first season. Um, and then also working with claims as well, if there was a problem down the line to figure out why the problem happened and how to repair it. Cause you know, once something is inside a wind turbine blade, um, it's very hard to, to do anything to it again. It, you know, if it's in the very root of the blade, you can climb up and poke around and fix it. It's still going to be expensive and painful if you have to do that on a, you know, a whole fleet. Um, but if it's further in the blade, then you can, then, then there's space to climb into, then, you know, you get a problem there and then you've got to get really creative with your repair solutions. And, and your experience in the factory, in the field, uh, climbing towers, I think that's unique in a lot of, uh, engineering. Usually engineers can get pigeonholed and you, you do that. And a lot of people like that, actually, that they prefer that uh, with the road you took was a little bit different. And that you're doing a lot of different aspects and learning learning the business and understanding how the business work, but also understanding how engineering work. Yeah. So um, one of the reasons why I took that that job, um, being the system owner for the blade heating systems, it's because it really did touch on a lot of different aspects of the uh, not just the wind turbine blade, but the whole wind turbine, and then you know the whole I don't know wind wind industry because. Um, it's not just something that's affecting the blade structure. It also, you know, has a control system that needs to talk to the, the turbine controller. Um, and then it's also, you know, was an important part of the sales process. If somebody, if a developer wants to install a wind farm in Northern Sweden, then the de-icing system is going to be one of the most important, um, technologies that they're going to be using to differentiate the, um, different competitors. So yeah, I was involved all, all through that whole life cycle right up to claims as well. So you went back to Australia sort of just as COVID was starting and created your consulting business. Yeah, just after. Just after, okay. Yeah, yeah, it was because of the pandemic that that we went back. It was just um Australia was a very difficult place to if you you know, it was great to be inside Australia, but if you had family there and you were outside Australia, it um it was hard. That that opened up some doors, though, in terms of the consulting business, because you came back loaded with skills, uh, and you had an intimate knowledge of blades. I've realised that actually timing was perfect, and I think Australia is actually the most exciting energy transition at the moment. When you see how fast we're putting in variable renewable sources, so wind and solar, it's faster than anywhere else. Um, and we're getting up to, you know, like a really significant share um, of our electricity grid that is from variable renewables. So, I mean, there's plenty of countries that have 100% or close to 100% renewables, but it's usually a lot of hydro and geothermal, which are a lot easier to manage in a kind of traditional way because they more closely represent, you know, big thermal, um, yeah, fossil fuel power plants. But we're doing it with wind and solar, which you can't just turn on and off whenever you want to, and you can't predict it, you know, a long, a long way out. Um, and so the, the challenges in dealing with a high proportion of variable renewables, it's Australia that's going to be solving those challenges first. And, you know, to a certain extent, we already are. Um, and so I find that a really, really exciting thing to be part of. And then also in terms of, like I said, back in 2010, it didn't feel like we were doing much in renewables. But in the period since then, a lot of wind energy has been rolled out. And now we're definitely at the point where, you know, there are defects in the field. And so, you know, like for someone like me that, that helps, you know, my clients in Australia, they work with on wind farms, I either help them with finding new technologies. So that's early in their, um, you know, development cycle. But the, the big bulk of the work that I do is when there's when there's problems, when they've got blade defects and they're not really feeling like the manufacturer is taking them seriously or they're not quite that they, they don't quite feel sure that um, that the right thing is happening. Um, that's that's when I step in to help. So in that sense, it's kind of perfect timing for that as well, because, you know, there's not a lot of people like me in Australia that have that experience in factories and climbing towers you know, I've worked with all of the the engineers from the um, from the OEMs, and so I kind of you know I say I, I speak speak the language of the Danish <laughs> the Danish engineer. It's 
true, both literally and metaphorically. Um, yeah, so I think that the timing timing is great for someone like me to move back to Australia. Australia is booming in wind industry and solar energy and all kinds of renewables. And the, your expertise in that area is is got to be a huge advantage to Australia in general. And it, I remember early on talking with you, you seem to be involved in a lot of initial uh, looks at new sites and and what kind of turbines to put where. It seemed like you're getting a lot of questions about that. And as, as the industry has grown, obviously, you're getting more and more into like the problem child wind turbines out there and getting them back in service. What are some of the, the big constraints you have right now in Australia on, on the service side and the maintenance side where you get brought in? Like, what does that typical client look like? What are they asking you to do? Yeah, so the most common category is blade defects. Um, usually it's, you, you know, one or two or three defects and the wind farm owner is starting to suspect that it might be part of a wider trend and the manufacturer is assuring them that it's it's not, they're just unlucky. Um, and y yeah, so then I'll, I'll step in to help with that process. So it usually looks like, um, first of all, the important thing is to just get the OEM I mean, to start taking them seriously and, and to engage. And I think that just, you know, having, having me there and I'm known in the industry, so people know, okay, we're not going to be able to fob them off anymore <laughs> because Rosemary's going to be asking the hard, hard questions. And I know, I know how it's normally been done. You know, I've been on the other side of the table for all of the kinds of work that I, I do like that. So I, I know what the manufacturer can do um, and I know when they're taking it seriously or, or when they're not. So usually the first thing to do is ask to see their root cause analysis. So, you know, when there's um, more than a couple of defects and a manufacturer is going to get a team together and say what's, what's caused this and, you know, brainstorm a whole bunch of ideas and then um, try and figure out what the reason is. And they might do some more tests to figure out, um, you know, which, which ideas are plausible or not. So the first thing to do is to get involved in, in that process, to have a look at their, their root cause analysis and to ask them, did you consider this? Did you consider this? And, you know, you've said that this is your most likely root cause, but that doesn't seem to match with, you know, this fact that you told us earlier on and just really get in there and question it. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, that can help to push, push things along. But one of the big issues that I see is in Australia, it's really, really popular to have these service agreements with an OEM. So, you know, you buy the turbine and at the same time you buy a service agreement from them for often the whole life of the, the wind farm or at least for quite a number of years. And Australian developers like this because they think that, um, you know, there isn't a lot of wind turbine ex expertise in Australia. There's a lot of development and construction project um, expertise. We're very good at that. But when it comes to the actual, you know, technologies in a wind farm, operating a wind farm, building a wind farm, I mean, sorry, building a, a wind turbine um, and all its components and maintaining it, there isn't that expertise there and the developers know they don't have it. And so they, they feel, I mean, it makes sense, it's logical. You feel like, okay, the OEM is going to do the best job of this. And then any issues that we have, you know, will be first in the queue to have them solved because it's, they're their own client. That sounds good and it usually is really good until the point where they have a problem, which they might not even know until they start, until there's enough downtime that it starts to show up in, you know, a monthly report of um, generation or, you, you know, on the balance sheet. Uh, that might be the first that they hear that there's actually a, a problem. Um, and then they might start to realize that there isn't much in the, the contract about their, their rights to documentation their rights to re request actions to be taken. Even, you know, often they're not even allowed to climb their own turbine. They're not allowed to bring somebody in. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm doing is to suggest um, monitoring intervals and uh, methods to, to monitor a situation. You know, you might want to put something in a blade to monitor for something and, um, and the manufacturer with the service agreement says, no, you can't do that. And, so they can be really restrictive. Yeah, and part of load should be brought in early in the process to get these ground rules in place before the farm is built. Because you're right, I think a lot of operators don't think about the consequences. If something goes wrong, what is the OEM going to do for you? you? You kind of assume they got your, your best interests at heart. Not always the case. 
obviously, Australia is not a place where blades are made. So all the blades that come in country are coming from usually far outside. How much of the blade issues that are happening in Australia are just due to shipping and trucking and all the transport? I think a normal normal amount, which is probably higher than most people would assume. When I started working for um, LM Wind Power, I was shocked at how, how often my blades got damaged in transport. I also think I was I was unlucky with my project. You know, like uh, uh, you know, when I was working on a new technology, you usually make one set of prototype blades, right? So you've got three. You don't usually make a spare. Occasionally, you might. But, um, you know, those three blades become very precious and everything happened to my blades. There was fires, there was forklifts driven into them. One, no, t- two, two separate times um, someone slid out on an icy road and um, tipped the blade into a ditch. Um, a mold fell off a ship. Wow. Yeah, like it's just, it's crazy. The amount of, the amount of stuff that, you know, there might have been a dozen prototype blades that I worked on in my career and something happened to just about every single one of them. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it happens, the transport damage happens. It's rare that that's, that that's bad though. In fact, I don't think I've worked, maybe I've seen one that I've worked on, but in general, it's really well-defined that people know how to repair them and there's no, there's no issue. You know, they just, it's, it's just something that happens. And so there's a system in place and you just fix it and put them up and no one ever thinks about it again. So yeah, that's not such a big, big problem. So the blade issues that are happening tend to be more in the in the quality inspection manufacturing side of the production rather than in anywhere else and that tends to be true in a lot of cases. So Australia you're so far removed from actually the factories there's not a lot of news that travels and you know in Europe word spreads quickly if there's a blade defect but it may not travel all the way to Australia. How do Australians, the operators, trying to keep up with all the technology and all the things that are happening? Like we've been seeing issues with Siemens Gamesa. We've seen issues with TPI. Can you help your customers understand like what's likely to be going on in those factories when Siemens complains about wrinkles, for example, and the blade molds? And TPI's complained about that recently, too, on the quality side. I'm assuming Australian operators really don't have an idea what that really means. Can you translate that for them and help them understand this is the risk. This is what you need to be watching for. I definitely can. And it's something that I, I really want to do a lot more of. I've, I've started um, reaching out pre, um, proactively to, to uh, developers um, and yeah, asset owners about issues that they might face, because I think it's not something that Australians are used to thinking about. One thing I'm really hoping to get in at an early stage is the offshore industry that hasn't quite reached the level that needs my involvement yet. But Um, soon they are going to be having conversations with manufacturers about which turbines they're going to get and which technology is going to be in those turbines. And, um, you know, the way that the sales process works and the technology development process works is often sales commitments are made before technologies are actually fully developed and definitely before they are, um, you know, fully matured and validated. Um, And again, this is a topic that I worked on when I was at LM Wind Power, when, you know, they would have sold a turbine that has uh, a system in it that is currently an idea in my in my head. And I've, you know, had a conversation with a couple of people um, and then they need to feel confident that this is going to do what I say it's going to do. Um, And especially their banks are very interested to know that it's going to do what what we're promising. And so there's a whole process where. You, you know, you you get together the um, customer and the manufacturer and you talk about how this technology is going to be developed, um, what technical milestones you're going to hit and when, and what kinds of tests that you're going to do. So, I mean, a lot of customers wouldn't realize that if you're going to place a big order for a new technology, if you're going to be one of the first customers for a new technology, that is totally reasonable for you to ask them to do certain tests, um, you, you know, to de-risk it. Because, I mean, it's great to be cutting edge and have the the be the first person with a shiny new technology but you don't actually want to be a guinea pig um so you can get someone like like me in to you know go in and then question what their plans are and to make sure that you add in the right tests at the right time so that you have something that might be new yes but is you know you're going to be confident that it's going to work yeah let's let's go down that pathway just for a moment because i want to understand on the structural side blade structural type certification or, or getting a type certificate for a blade, particularly a new blade. So if I'm in Australia 
and you're getting offered a lot of new products in Australia because the marketplace is huge, right? And there's a lot of emphasis on bigger turbines. Most likely an operator in Australia is going to be offered a brand new turbine, a brand new blade design. When you're involved in that and brought in early on to, to help that operator kind of walk that pathway, when you're working, then when working with an OEM, are there things that they should be doing beyond the sort of type certification structural test on a new blade design to, to verify, yes, it's going to be working in Australia for the next 25 years? Yeah, there are. And it, it depends what how unusual the technology is. So if it's just like a totally standard blade that has nothing particularly special on it, then I would definitely trust the um, standard certification process would be would be good enough and there'd be no need to do anything else. But if you think about one blade that I worked on when I was at um, LM and that we have a lot of in Australia is a Cypress um, Cypress platform. The, they had those split split blades, right? The blades come in two pieces. Two pieces, yeah. Yeah, and so we actually, we I was working on that um, while I was still in Denmark um, and then we had a team of early customers come over and we demonstrated how that is going to work and yeah, answered, answered questions about, you know, what happens if X, what happens if Y um, happens. And uh, the results of that, you know, meet and greet, show and tell kind of thing is that the development team gets ideas and also makes promises to reassure their customers. And, and they do actually shape the development process a bit. It's not, um, yeah, it's not totally sealed off where the customer just gets what they're given when you get involved early and in that early process, you do have the ability to request extra tests to, um, you know, say, haven't you, don't you think that this problem is likely to happen? Um, and then, you know, the engineering team goes off and tests for that issue and finds, yeah, the, okay, our customer is right. There, there is a risk that this happens. And so they tweak the design a bit so it doesn't happen. So, um, yeah, when it works, when it works well like that, you get a much more reliable product. Well, let me ask about another problem area, which is worldwide, but I think Australia is unique in this, and your experience is unique, lightning. And you as a structural engineer were around lightning testing and lightning design because you were designing blade DI systems, which tend to be electrical systems, and lightning is a big concern around that. So you have some exposure to the lightning testing world and the sort of what happens in the field. In Australia, the lightning is particularly odd, I think, at times. And it would seem like the lightning damage you would see on blades there would be a little bit unique versus what you may see in Iowa, the United States. And your expertise there has got to be super helpful. If, if I'm an operator in Australia and I'm taking some lightning strikes, I would want to have your eyes on it from a structural side to determine Am I in trouble? Do I need to do anything about it? In a perfect world, a wind turbine blade has a lightning protection system in it. It gets struck by lightning and the lightning goes through the lightning cable and into the ground and, and everything's fine. The, you know, the blade is still perfect afterwards. Um, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't need to repair in, um, you know, in a perfect world, right? Um, but when every now and then a strike is a bit bigger or it hits somewhere that you weren't expecting, you know, it's statistical. So you can't say that this, um, you have one damaged wind turbine blade, you can't say this is a defective lightning protection system um, because, yeah, it might have been a bigger strike than it was designed to um, to take. It might have been, um, you, you know, it might have struck in a place that just was, you know, just one of those things. You were the freak, freak occurrence that it hit somewhere that, you know, is one in a million chance. But when you get two like that, you're like, okay, so it's a bit harder to believe that this is one in a million and you know then you get three four five at what point do you start to say okay this is actually um, a problem with the lightning protection system and the manufacturer is responsible for this um you get these yeah you get these interesting fights between the asset owner the insurance company and the manufacturer these you know kind of three-way um three-way fights where everyone's trying to push push off responsibility onto someone else. And if it, the if there are a small number of blades involved, like too small to do statistical analysis on, then it is usually the asset owner that just ends up having to repair that. But 
yeah, they're really interesting issues in Lightning are when you try and try and establish, you know, that a system is not designed correctly. And I think when you look across the whole planet's wind turbines at the moment, you do get enough numbers to see something is different now. There's more damage than there there used to be. Um, and I think, yeah, uh, oh, I made a, a recent video on my, my channel on how the whole process works with, um, you know, design and testing and certification and then how that actually fares in the field. And you helped me with that, Alan, so you're, you're aware of, of what we did there. Um, but, yeah, it is uh, it, it's because blades are getting longer and they've got carbon fiber. I guess that's the main two reasons why things are different now. Um, and then, yeah, lightning also varies from area to area. So maybe, you know, until recently we didn't have that many wind turbines in Australia that it was, you know, obvious that, that things were maybe not quite the same here. But that's all still playing out. And, yeah, those are the really interesting issues when you're looking at the de the design itself rather than, you know, individual damages. Well, that's why you're so useful in Australia with the Cypress blade in particular. So let's just talk Cypress just for a brief moment and lightning, which is the Cypress, because it's a two-piece blade, has a unique lightning protection system, unlike any other blade that I've ever seen. Uh, and you being up close to that and that blade being used a lot in Australia has got to be a huge advantage uh, in terms of knowledge base. So, you know, if uh, anybody has a GE turbine is having some issues, well... Rosemary's your person to call because she probably understands what happened on the inside, why, why it's designed the way that it is. And you're right. I mean, as much engineering as a company can throw at a problem, when you're delivering products worldwide that do affect the atmosphere and they, they do affect how lightning strikes, they're going to react differently in different countries. And it's good to have you in Australia kind of following up on that and being a resource for Australia. That's hugely important. Rosemary, it's been great having you on the podcast to talk about Partalote Consulting. How do people reach out to you and get a hold of Partalote Consulting? Um, well, you can head to the website, which is partaloteconsulting.com. So I'll just spell that because maybe not everyone's familiar with the Partalote bird. Um, it's P-A-R-D-A-L-O-T-E, consulting.com. And I actually just the other day put up on the, the blog page an article about lightning. So if you are worried about lightning, then you can go check that out. And I am gradually adding in um, technical articles about all aspects of, of wind and other, yeah, other things in the energy transition. Um, you can also find me on LinkedIn, public consulting's on LinkedIn as well. But um, yeah, Rosemary Barnes on LinkedIn. And on Twitter, it's Eng with Rosie, E N G with Rosie, which is linked to my YouTube channel, Engineering with Rosie. Um, yeah, so that's probably the biggest biggest resource. There's a lot on wind energy on there. My early videos were were nearly all just based on, you know, personal experience and knowledge. So yeah, especially check out the back catalog if you're interested in wind energy. Rosemary, it's been great to have you on as a guest. Uh, we have been co-hosting together for so long now. We just figured now is the time. We need to have you on as a guest and talk about your consulting business because it's doing great work. So Rosemary, thanks for doing this. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Cool.